Okay. That was hard because we were not in control of our own slides this time. So we were a little uncoordinated, but welcome. My name is Ann Merchant and we are very glad that you are with us today. And as always, I am joined by... I'm Rick Levert, Program Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Yes. And we've had a little bit of a break since our last event. So we are very glad that you are back with us and that we are going to be joined by a longtime friend of the program, Jen Golbeck, who is going to be here with us today to talk to us about Benford's Law, something I don't know anything about. So I'm super excited to hear this talk. And as many of you know, the work of the National Academies spans a wide spectrum of topics. And in our capacity as advisors to the nation. We have a significant portfolio of work that connects to the mathematical and computer sciences. Um, I've been here a long time at the Academy, and I remember when we published Making the Nation Safer um, back in the early 2000s, and that was considered to be a benchmark in cybersecurity. And there are a host of, of reports that we do in this area. And if you like to take a deep dive, you can go onto our website where all of those reports are free to download and read for or without any cost if you're so inclined. But math and computer sciences also make up a large portfolio of the work that we do at the Science and Entertainment Exchange. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I'm going to dig deep and we do a <laughs> lot of uh, computer science consults and hacking and black hat, white hat, that kind of thing. But in the year 2013, a film director, a very famous film director by the name of Michael Mann called us up and asked us for a coder, coder hacker type person. We recommended a guy named Chris McKinley at UCLA who ended up teaching the film star Chris Hemsworth how to code for that particular film, which turned out to be called Black Hat. Um, if you, and that's just one of the 3,300 consults we've done on feature films, TV shows, video games. If you are a STEM professional and you're just getting wind of the kind of work we do and you're interested, please do volunteer. We've gotten a whole bunch of volunteers since we, uh, since we moved virtual and did these, these pandemic events. So we'd be very interested in being in touch with you. Uh, I want to thank today's sponsor, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, for uh, giving us the money to do this event. Um, and also individual donors like many of you who donated today. If you did donate at the supporter level, we will be sending you one of these. Um, I am a little bit behind in getting them to people. So if you did donate and you haven't gotten yours yet, I'm sorry, we'll get them to you ASAP. Um, and so today, if at any point you have a question while Jen is speaking, all you have to do is on the little Q&A window, you can uh, ask your question and I will be popping back up at the back end of the event after Jen speaks and I will be the voice of the audience. So please ask questions at any time. Excellent. And so my rabbit hole this week actually connects directly to the academies and to the lobby at the Keck Center. So for any of you who have visited the Keck Center you probably know what I mean by it being a bit of a rabbit hole, because once you're in there, you really understand that it's almost really hard to leave that place. When we built the Keck Center in 2002, we wanted that building to really say something about who we are and about the way in which science, medicine, and engineering have made significant contributions to society. So the whole space is an engraved set of murals. It's sort of an encyclopedia of science. So when I was thinking about today's event, I started to thinking about, started thinking about what was on those walls, those murals. And I started thinking about the abacus that's there and you can actually touch it and move it and play with it. And, and that is the abacus is, is actually, I mean, it was developed thousands of years ago and it's essentially the first computer. And so if you're ever in DC and you have some time to come visit the Keck Center, come and get lost in our lobby because it really is an amazing space. And I think Sachi is going to put a link down there and you can experience it virtually and kind of go explore. So I encourage you to do that. So when we first got in touch with Jen, my rabbit hole for this week, she was like, I can do one of two topics, Benford's Law. And I was like, what is that? And she said, <laughs> documentary that she was in, which was super cool. I can't wait for her to tell you all about Benford's Law. But the other topic that she did not do was she was like the creepiness of the internet. So I googled the creepiness of the internet. And you know what I found? I found uh, an article by an insurance company about the insurance that companies are going to have to carry to protect against deep fakes in the near future, which I had never considered. But there you go. Creepy internet. 
That is the creepy internet. And so I have to say by way of introduction of Jen, so part of my job, part of your job as well, is that we are kind of talent scouts. We go out and look for great people who can talk about amazing things that we can then sort of grab and put on our virtual stage. And so I was in the audience um, at TEDx Mid-Atlantic many, many years ago. And on the stage walked this very lovely woman who looked like she was going to give us this really feel good talk because Jen is just this really happy looking person who then talked about really creepy things. And so I I remember writing down, oh my God, this woman is amazing. We have to get her on our stage and sent her an invitation to ask her to come speak at an exchange event. And I felt so lucky that she said yes. And I continue to feel lucky every time she says yes. So we got lucky this time. Um, And so Jen, we really, are so happy that we were able to get you because we know how busy you are. And so please come and tell us all about Benford's Law. I don't, I think it can be creepy. I don't know, but we're going to learn along with you as you, as you tell us all about it. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to connect it back to some of the stuff that you guys found in your rabbit holes this week. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Yeah. So thank you for trusting me. And I guess everyone in the audience for trusting the exchange enough to come listen to a math talk about an obscure statistical technique and hope that it's going to be interesting. I hope that it will be. Um, So Benford's Law uh, actually was originally discovered by Newcomb in 1881. He was like in the library and this is 1881, no calculators. So they had logarithmic tables, which were actually books. If you wanted to compute a logarithm, which we do all the time in science and engineering, you'd go to the book, you'd look up the number that you wanted the log of, and then there would be like a page that had the values. And he noticed that the front of the book was much more used than the back of the book. The back looked almost new, but the front was really weathered. And he was like, why is it that people are looking up numbers that start with ones and twos way more often than they're looking up numbers that start with eight or nine? Shouldn't all the numbers be equally likely? And it turns out they're not. He actually published a little paper on this. And then later in the 1930s, Benford came along, kind of rediscovered this and did a bunch of analysis of it. And so Benford gets the credit for it, even though he's not the first guy who found it. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes kind of just telling you what it is. I promise I will not bore you with a lot of deep math in there, but then we're going to look at all of the different ways that it applies. So I only have a couple slides um, that I'm going to put up and down. But essentially what we're talking about with Benford's law is, so you have a bunch of numbers. I've got three of them up here on the screen and we're looking at the first digit of those numbers. So the nine or the one or the three. And if you kind of just intuitively think about it, you might think that numbers that start with nine are just as likely that numbers would start with one or a three. That's the question that we're asking, but it turns out that's not true in lots and lots of naturally occurring systems. Ones are much more common. Than anything else. And so this is the graph that you should kind of put in your head. This is what Benford's law says. So basically in a naturally occurring system, if you're looking at numbers, ones account for about 30% of all the numbers. And then twos are about 17 and a half percent going down to where nines are less than 5% of the numbers. And this is Benford's law. If you're a super math geek, this is the formula for Benford's law, um, where N would be your first digit there, but you don't need to remember that part. But this is the kind of distribution that we see showing up all over the place. And it turns out that this occurs across all sorts of spaces in all kinds of interesting ways. So when Benford published his paper on this, he looked, for example, at the surface area of all the rivers on Earth. And they follow this distribution. So about 30% of them have a surface area that starts with a one. About 5% of them have a surface area that starts with a five, uh, with a nine. It doesn't matter what unit you measure in. So if you're measuring surface area, you can measure it in square feet or square kilometers or hectares or acres, whatever you want, it still works. It also works, this is for the math geeks, if you change the base. So we normally work in base 10, uh, so you count zero to nine, but you can change to base eight or base 12, base 16, anything except two. And Benford's law also works there. So it really is how these numbers are actually put together. As I said, Benford observed them in the surface area of lakes, um, the decay rate of 
um, atomic elements. Uh, we can see it in volcanoes, the magnitude of the eruptions of volcanoes or the time of the eruptions of volcanoes. You can also do this yourself though. So one thing that Benford published in 1931 is that he went into an uh, issue of Reader's Digest. He wrote down all the numbers that were in Reader's Digest and they followed this pattern as well. So there's all kinds of places that we can look at this. I'm going to talk about some, but I was like, I should come up with one like for this. So this morning um, I went and I did some analysis of my own. So I went on to the numbers.com, which has movie production budgets, um, domestic and worldwide gross. And I grabbed the data for all the movies that had budgets of $10 million or higher. So it turns out there were 11,769 movies that had that budget or higher on their data. And then I just pulled all of their budgets, their domestic gross, their worldwide gross. I grabbed the first digit and I computed the distribution. And look at how beautifully it works. This is like the most fun thing about Benford's Law. It totally works for all these kinds of things. So among those almost 12,000 movies, about 30% of them have a budget and worldwide and domestic gross that starts with a one and about 5% of them start with a nine. So it pops up like this in all kinds of systems where this isn't engineered, nobody's creating this, it just naturally appears in these places. And so it gives us a tool to really understand a lot of natural systems. Now it doesn't show up everywhere. So if you have uh, a really controlled system. So for example, like zip codes in the United States, those are assigned in a particular range. It's not a naturally occurring system. And so Benford's law doesn't work there. There's also some mathematical assumptions that need to be met. And I'm not gonna talk about those until the very end because they're not super interesting, uh, but they do come into play when people try to use this in the wrong way. But generally when you have numbers, and they're kind of growing, they're in natural systems, whether it's chemistry, biology, physics, and also um, engineered systems like accounting, uh, we see Benford's Law apply. So I actually, you know, I think I had come across Benford's Law in my academic life. I'm a computer scientist, but I really encountered it listening to an episode of Radiolab uh, back in like 2015. And they were talking about the main place that Benford's Law is used in the world, which is in accounting. So if you take your tax returns and you write down all the numbers on your tax returns and you figure out what percentage of them start with a one and a two and a three and so on, it will follow Benford's Law extremely reliably. 30% of them will start with a one down to about 5% of them will start with a nine. And this works in all kinds of financial documents. So what happens when Benford's Law doesn't apply. What does that mean? And a lot of times what it means is that someone's lying on their tax returns. Because if you go in and you're like, I'm going to lie on my taxes and I'm going to change some of these numbers to get me more money back. You, th you think, well, there's not a lot of numbers here that start with a seven or an eight. I'd better make some more of those, right? Our intuition is that it looks weird to have a bunch of numbers starting with one and two and not very many numbers starting with the other ones. So we try to evenly distribute them. We kind of suck as humans at distributing numbers in a natural way because we look for different kinds of patterns. And so accounting professionals use Benford's law to detect fraud in accounting. And it's so reliable that you can actually use this in court. It's admissible as evidence uh, of accounting fraud. Now, there are certainly places where you may not have that show up. So you could, for example, sell a product that you price at $9.99 and that product is going to show up all over the place in your books. And so there may be a much higher occurrence of nines. And then it's not necessarily fraud, but you do want an explanation of it. But generally, the violation of Benford's law means that there's something fraudulent going on. And so Radiolab interviewed some accountants. I was totally fascinated by this and I just couldn't stop thinking about it for a week, which for me is usually a sign that I need to do some research on this, uh, but I am not an economist or an accountant. I'm a computer scientist. I study social networks uh, and a lot of the creepy stuff that happens there. And so it makes me think, well, this must have some application in social networks, which are kind of natural systems that kind of grow up and evolve, where could we see Benford's law potentially apply there? 
And so if you're looking to apply Benford's law, essentially what you want to do is come up with a place that numbers exist. You have to be able to count something. So what can we count on social media and in social networks? And for me, looking at the structure of social networks, who do you follow? Who follows you? Who are your friends? That's a place where we can have numbers. So I started off with some data sets that exist out there. And I looked at you know, for Facebook, if we have a big sample of tens of thousands of Facebook users, do their friend counts follow Benford's law? So do about 30% of people have friend counts that start with a one and about 5% of people have friend counts that start with a nine? We see that nice curve. And it turns out it totally works. It works on Facebook. It works on Twitter. It works on all these different networks. And then I said, well, like that's super interesting by itself, but does it work for individuals? So we can say on Facebook, Everybody follows this law. But for me, if I look at just my friends, does it work? So essentially the way you would do that is I would say, okay, here's all of my friends on Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram. What do their friend counts look like? So I basically get a number for each one of my friends. And then does that follow Benford's law? You know, we don't know if that's necessarily going to be true. We know it works for the network as a whole. And if you just randomly pick people out of the network, it should work. But I don't pick friends randomly. They kind of come from a group of people I know. It's going to be a much tightly, more tightly connected group than if I just randomly friended people. But it turns out that Benford's Law works there too. It works for individuals as well as for the network as a whole. So this is an experiment that you can also try yourself. You can go on to whatever social media platform you like the most get a list of all the people who follow you or that you follow, do the one that's smaller usually because it's going to take a while to write this down. And then for each of those people, get their friend or follower counts and you're going to find most likely it follows Benford's law. So let me show you one more slide uh, that's got that data in it. So what we're looking at here, uh, the bottom is those first digits so numbers that start with a one or a two or a three. The percentages are on the vertical axis like always. And then each different color is a different social network. Look at how beautifully, when I discovered this, like when I finished this research and I was like sitting in my little room, I was like, I'm the only person on earth that knows this. And it was a very exciting moment for me. But one interesting thing that's not shown in this graph is that you can see up at the top, it says Pinterest followers. So Pinterest has a Twitter sort of structure. You can follow people, uh, but they don't necessarily have to follow you back. So there's how many followers do I have? That's the number that I'm using here. But we also have following. How many people do I follow on Pinterest? Uh, and that doesn't work with Benford's law. It looks a lot like Benford, except at the five, there's a huge spike. A ton of people have a following count that starts with a five. So basically the number of people that they follow. So why is that the case? Why does it sort of look like it works, but the five is this huge number? Like what a weird number for it to be. And so I went and I dug in and the thing that's going on there is that when you sign up for a Pinterest account, they automatically follow five people for you. So you already are like pre-populated with popular people using the platform. So there's a ton of people who sign up for Pinterest. They're automatically following five people because Pinterest does that for them without them even having to do anything. And then they never go and follow anybody else. So it's this really interesting artifact where there, you know, is something artificial going on. It's not really fraudulent, but it's manipulating the natural way that people would create connections. And so we do get this violation of Benford's law that's not necessarily nefarious, but it does tell us that there's something going on that isn't what we would expect. So this was super exciting for me. And as a scientist, like just having the knowledge that that works, like that's super cool, right? Benford's Law works on social networks. I can write a paper about this. It goes into the annals of all those things that Benford's Law works on. That's very cool. Uh, but I was like, okay, well, let's look at where it doesn't work because that's always interesting. And so the way I had collected data on Twitter meant that I could actually go look at the Twitter accounts of anybody that I had this information for. So I had tens of thousands of Twitter users and I could see all these distributions. So for me, here's the percentage of my friends who have a follower count that starts with a one and a two and a so on. So I sorted this list to look at who are the people who just don't look like they follow Benford's law at all. Like who are the most distant people from what Benford's law would predict? So I had them sorted from like best to worst. And I looked at those people at the bottom who just didn't look anything like what Benford law would predict. And I was like, well, let's go see what these accounts look like. And what it turned out is that there were about 120 accounts that looked nothing like 
the Benford's Law distribution. And 118 of them were Russian bots. And they were all the same Russian bots controlled by the same person. So they were tweeting out in Russian. Um, It was clearly automated. They were tweeting kind of quotes from novels or lines from technical manuals. Sometimes it wasn't even complete sentences. It would just start and then cut off before the Twitter character limit. They all would kind of insert emojis in the same place. They had the same set of stock photos that would appear as their profile picture. And when I dug a little deeper into that, because I do a lot of research on social networks, we could see they were actually controlled by the same program that was posting for them. What were they doing? I have no idea. I actually brought in some Russian students to work with me to understand what was going on. We can't really figure it out. Um, Since I did that initial work, I tracked that network out and found about 100,000 accounts that belonged to this one Russian network. And it violated Benford's law because you set up these bots and then you want them to look legitimate. You don't want it to be a person with zero followers who's tweeting out. You want it to look like a real person. And so they would follow each other. And when you're writing a program, you generally try to have just the same thing, right? Follow 400 other accounts. And you may do a little bit of randomness in there, but you've got a number. You're not going to try to make it match Benford's law. And in fact, it's really hard to do that. Um, You could say, follow 30% of the bots that have a follower account that starts with one and so on. But Benford's Law works in other bases too. So you really would have to do it in a very natural looking way where I could say, I'm going to convert this to base eight. Does it still work? And if you engineered it, it probably wouldn't work. So it's hard to get around Benford's Law. And these accounts weren't even trying to do that. So we found this massive Russian botnet doing, we don't really know what. Um, But that was really interesting to me that I didn't set out looking to find fraud with Benford's Law. I just wanted to see if it applied here. And it turns out, yeah, it applies. And when the accounts don't follow Benford's Law, they are doing what exactly a fraudulent thing is on social media. They're fake accounts, they're bots, they're tweeting out stuff automatically, they're not behaving in a natural way. So that kind of led me to another social media step, which is what are the other kinds of fraud that bots might commit. And the really easy to track one is where you can buy likes or retweets or followers across different platforms. So I did a project where I had a fake Twitter account tweet out a bunch of nonsense. It would tweet like a random link with just a number on it, nothing that any real person would like or tweet. And then I bought likes on Twitter for hundreds of those fake tweets. And so I know all the people who liked those tweets were bots that were paid to like the account. They weren't real people. And when I looked at those bots, they didn't follow Benford's law at all, pretty much. When I looked at people who had the same number of likes or retweets, but we know they pretty much came from natural sources, they tended to look exactly like Benford's law would predict. Same thing worked on Facebook. So if people were buying likes on Facebook or buying uh, friends or followers to their group pages on Facebook, when they bought those from bots, the bots didn't look like Benford's Law. When they got them from real people, they kind of naturally grew that following. Then it did look like Benford. So Benford's Law doesn't let you detect every single bot that's out there. But when there is fraudulent activity happening, often you'll see a deviation from Benford's Law where it works just fine if you're actually getting that naturally, which is pretty cool. So this, I thought, was sort of winding up my life as a Benford's Law analyst. I think it's cool. I look for it in places that it goes. Um, And I do a lot of work on kind of bots and other malicious online behavior. Um, There are other people looking at it in this space. So Rick had mentioned he went down the rabbit hole of looking at deep fakes. You actually can use Benford's Law to detect deep fakes. And this gets very into the nitty gritty, but essentially there's signatures that show up Uh, not in what you visually see in a deep fake, but in the encoding of those files. When those files, like when a video file is naturally created, it has characteristics that follow Benford's law. When it's a deep fake and it's been manipulated, those characteristics get messed up and it stops adhering to Benford's law. So you actually can use it to detect things like manipulated images and deep fakes and other things. So I figured it would play a little bit of a role in my work as someone who studies bad stuff people do on social media, but I didn't think it was another thing that I would dive deep into. And then um, Latif Nasser came along with Connected, a show on Netflix. Episode four of that show is called Digits and it's all about Benford's Law. And they asked me to be in it. And so I came in and I gave a, you know, the short version of what you just heard from me. 
And so it was great, like really exciting to talk about this thing that obviously I care a lot about. And it brought Benford's Law to a much bigger audience last summer. I think the show was released in July of last summer. So a lot more people knew about Benford's Law having watched that documentary than before it came out. And then the election happened. And of course, people are interested in fraud in that election, specific people are. And they said, hey, I learned about this thing called Benford's Law on Netflix. So I'm going to apply it to all this election data that I can get. And hey, this election data doesn't follow Benford's Law. So that must mean that there's fraud in the election. And that's absolutely incorrect. That's not how it works. Uh, Benford's Law has been used to detect election fraud, but in a very different way than what these people were doing. So if you come away with kind of the knowledge that I have given you in this talk, which is about the level of knowledge that you get if you watch the connected documentary on Netflix, you go, Benford's Law looks like this distribution. You can go look up what that is. And I know how to use Excel. So I'm going to grab this uh, data about the elections, like how many votes each candidate got in each precinct. And I'm going to count the number of first digits and look at it and compare it to Benford and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't work, it must be fraud. That's the, that's the kind of, I watched a Netflix documentary way of applying Benford's law to election fraud. It turns out that's not how it works. Um, so I said before, Benford's law requires some mathematical assumptions and mathematical assumptions are not the kind of thing that you talk about with non-mathematicians because they're boring and you know it's not like the most engaging conversation. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you a few of them so we can talk about it in the context of this election. So one thing that Benford's law requires is independence. So if you have a bunch of numbers that you're comparing Benford's law to, those numbers should just be able to vary on their own. So if I'm uh, looking at a lake, there shouldn't be any constraint on that lake. It should be able to be as big or as small as it wants. If I'm creating a new social media account and I'm going to make friends, that number should just be able to grow independent of anything else. So that independence basically means the number doesn't depend on anything else. It can vary as it likes. That's not the case with election data. So if we're looking, say, at all the precincts in Chicago, which is data that you could get from the 2020 election, how many votes Biden got in a certain precinct depends on a couple things. One, it depends on how many voters there were in that precinct. So if there's 2,000 voters in the precinct, Biden cannot get 3,000 votes. Uh, it's constrained. It also depends on how many votes Trump got. So if there's 2,000 voters and Trump got say 800 votes, Biden basically gets the rest. There were, you know, some, obviously some third party candidates, but they're getting a really small fraction of the vote. So essentially Biden's votes are the rest of the votes after Trump gets his. So it depends on both the size of the precinct and how many votes the other person gets. You can't vote for both. And so this independence requirement for Benford is totally violated with that, with that sort of data. So that's one problem. The other issue is that Benford requires data to span many orders of magnitude. So you can't just have numbers that go from like a thousand to a hundred. They're all three digit numbers because Benford's law generally doesn't work within one number range like that. You want to have some numbers in the tens and the hundreds and the thousands and the 10 thousands. And so really have a span across different uh, orders of magnitude, basically different numbers of zeros at the end. And precinct data doesn't work like that either. We don't want to have a precinct with five people in it and have another precinct with 30,000 people in it. Precincts are engineered to be roughly the same size. And so if you go into Chicago, precincts are about 1,000 to 1,500 people. And there's certainly some variation in there, but there's not precincts, a bunch of them with tens of thousands of people, and there's not precincts with tens of people. So you're constrained within a very small range of numbers, and that doesn't work with Benford's law. So all of these people um, who believed Trump's lies that, the, uh, that there was a lot of fraud in the election were taking their spreadsheets and they're saying, look, I applied Brentford's law and there's fraud in the election. And I didn't come in and even tell them there wasn't fraud in the election. I just told them that they were applying Benford's law wrong. And I very kindly explained to them the requirement for independence and spanning orders of magnitude. Um, and then I spent about a month getting death threats and all kinds of other mean things said to me and the campus police had to get involved. And then one of the things that they liked to do is point me to Walter Meebane, who's a professor 
at Michigan who has done research on using Benford's law. And they said, you know, have you watched this Netflix documentary? And I was like, my friends, I'm in the Netflix documentary. And they're like, well, this guy, Walter Mebane is in here. And he says, you can use Benford's law to understand election fraud, which you can kind of, um, because Benford's law, in addition to working on those first digits, like we've been talking about, there's a variation of it that also works on the second digit. So if your number is 123, we've been talking about looking at the one, that first digit, but you can also look at the two, the second digit. And it's not the same distribution, but there is a version of Benford that works there. And it gets rid of some of those other assumptions because we can talk about, we can talk about why, but basically that second digit varies in a different way than the first digit does. So Walter Mebane has created a technique for using this to detect election fraud. It's not nearly as reliable as first digit Benford is on all the kinds of systems that we've talked about, but it can give you some kind of signal. And it's basically supposed to be used as one tool in combination with a bunch of other auditing techniques. And so Walter Mebane himself, I think, was dealing with similar sorts of stuff that I was. So he actually put out a paper saying, hey, all you people who want to use Benford's law to detect election fraud, here's how you do it correctly, all the math included. And what this has proven is there actually was no fraud in the election. So he went farther than I did um, to say, yeah, I've used all of these techniques for detecting election fraud and can show you definitively on this data that this is exactly what we would expect in a free and fair election. So uh, while it was not a fun time in my life, I was very stressed out for about a month dealing with that kind of harassment, um, simply for defending and explaining my favorite mathematical technique. Uh, it's an interesting story of what happens when you give people knowledge of a, a kind of fun and mind-blowing mathematical tool, and they don't take the time to learn all of the other kind of complicated math that underlies it. And, you know, I think this is true of all science. Like there's really fun things that we can learn about things that are not our field and our specialty. But if you want to use it, it gets much more complicated when you actually come to apply it. And elections are one of those things. So with the few minutes that I have left before we switch to questions, uh, the most common question that I get when I talk about Benford is like, but why? <laughs> like, why do things actually follow this pattern? And there's not a great simple explanation for that. Um, there are some deep mathematical explanations for it, but I think the most intuitive explanation is that almost all of the places where we see it apply are things where numbers are growing. So if you think about a lake or a river, um, these are things where we know Benford's law applies, the length of rivers, the surface areas of rivers or lakes, Benford's law applies there. You can have a really little lake, right? Uh, you can have a pond, you can have a puddle. They start off very small and then they eventually grow to be bigger. So they're always growing. The same thing with say the friends that you have on social media, you start off with zero friends and then you grow that following to get more friends. Um, and this, this works in money too, right? You start off with $0 if you're doing accounting and then you get more money and those, those numbers are growing. So when you have numbers growing, say that you have 10 friends on social media, how much work do you have to do to get to 20 friends? You basically have to double the number of people that you're reaching. But if you have 90 friends, how much work do you have to get to 100 where then you've shifted from a nine to a one again. Well, you only have to get 10% more friends to go from a nine with 90 friends to a, starting with a one with a hundred friends, but to get then from that hundred friends to now have 200 friends to get from the one to the two, you have to do a hundred percent more friends. So going from the one to the two is a lot more work than going from a two to a three and from a three to a four and so on. And so if you're growing, it's easier to move to the next number as you go towards a nine. It's easy to move from a nine to a one and then it gets a lot harder again. So people tend to hang out in those ones and twos because it's a lot of work to move to the next digit where if you're up in those higher numbers, it's a relatively small amount of work to move through those and then get back to a one again. And this is, this is why we need those multiple orders of magnitude where you're not just looking from like a hundred to a thousand because we need that easy shift from the nine back to the one that's the next biggest number. So that's why Benford goes across multiple orders of magnitude and why we generally tend to see it in systems where the numbers are growing a little bit bigger every time. So if you wanna try this out for yourself, like I said, you can look at your friends on social media. You can also take 
you know, a news article. Um, if you get a printed newspaper, it certainly works if you just write down all the numbers in the newspaper. But you could just take, say, the top five or 10 articles from whatever your favorite news site is, just write down any number that's in there. Doesn't even matter that they all come from the same place, just write those down. It'll apply there. Um, and yeah, it's a really fun way to kind of test this out. You can also do it on your taxes. Um, don't freak out too much if it doesn't apply, but you may want to talk to your accountant if your taxes uh, of all the numbers on your tax forms seem to violate Benford's law. So I hope that was a kind of mind blowing and exciting introduction to my favorite obscure statistical technique. Um, and with that, I think we have plenty of time for questions to you know, answer whatever you all want to know about this. All right, I'm back. Hello. So first question from Joe and P. Vance is, is there any consistent sort of distribution for the second digit or the last digit? For the second digit, absolutely. Um, it's a. It's also what we would call a logarithmic distribution where you've got that curve like I was showing you before, but it's not the same percentages. I don't actually have them memorized off the top of my head. Um, but in fact, when you get into a lot of the deeper fraud analysis, like there's full academic conferences on Benford's law. How do people keep having things to stay? Um, it's that they're looking at the other digits um, and it definitely works on a second digit and kind of looking for how likely are those to apply and when can, you know, what do you combine them with other things? So yeah, it, it works on second digits. It does not work on last digits. So if you're just looking at the final digit, those seem to be pretty evenly distributed. Um, and we have a couple of people asking about zero. Yeah, um, so for a first digit Benford, you don't use zero. Because you know, if you have a number that's like 0537, well, that's just 537. The zero isn't representing any value there. It's just like, there's no thousands. So we don't use that because you could always start a number with a ton of zeros and it's, it's a, it equal to the same thing. When you're doing second digit Benford though, then you do have to include zero because you could have 100 as a number and the zero there is, is meaningful where it's not when it's the first digit. Hmm. Um, so quick note, um, it's not always evident and we can't always tell what gender a person is by their name, but it does seem like there are a lot of men asking questions. So ladies, please, if you have a question, please do put it in the feed. Um, Will um, asks, as a data set gets larger, does it make uh, fraud using Benford easier or harder to spot? That's a great question. The bigger the data set, the more likely it is that we expect it to adhere to Benford's law. So if you have, so you have 20 numbers that you've pulled from somewhere, like they'll probably look like Benford, but if you have a couple extra nines, it's gonna really throw your percentages off. Um, so with the, with the analysis that I did with the movie budgets and, and gross this morning, I started with just like the first 500 movies. I think like it was one screen grab of data from that website and it looked kind of Ben Ferdy, but it was not perfect. Um, when I grabbed all those 11,000 movies, it's almost a perfect match. So as the data set gets bigger, you expect a much closer adherence to Benford's law. And so if you see a violation there, it's even greater evidence that something weird is going on. Um, so Bradley asks, is there any relationship between Benford and the golden ratio? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, so you guys had it in the opening slides that my dog account, I rescued golden retrievers and, uh, they're very famous on the internet and their account is the golden ratio four, which I named them as a squad after, uh, after the golden ratio. I don't think, I don't know of a connection. So the golden ratio mathematically, um, if, if I will allow myself like a one minute diversion here. Um, so there's a thing called the Fibonacci sequence, which is another fun one that you may have learned in elementary school. So you start off, it's a series of numbers. So you start off with a one and another one. And then to get the next number, you add the previous two together. So your first two numbers are one and one. You add those together and your next number is two. And to get the next number, you do two plus one is three. And then the next number is three plus two, right? The two previous is five, eight and 13 and 21 and so on. That's the Fibonacci sequence. It goes up forever. And the golden ratio is basically if you take one number and you divide it by the previous number, that gives you an estimate of the golden ratio. So the golden ratio is just actually a constant number. Um, and you can, you can estimate it, but I don't, I don't know of any relationship 
between that. The, the real question would be, do the Fibonacci numbers follow Benford's law? That would be an interesting question. I'm sure someone has checked. You all can Google while I'm talking because I don't want to Google while y'all are looking. Um, but that, if there is a connection, I suspect that would be it. The Fibonacci numbers follow Benford and they might uh, they, because they grow in a way where they may. So someone can Google that and put in a Q and A and let us know. Yeah, this, this may be another question for that. Rachel asks, do you have examples of Benford actually being used in a court case? Or maybe do you know where someone could go to try to find that? For sure. Um, there's tons of examples. If you just Google um, Benford's law and accounting fraud, um, you can. So if you're a lawyer, if you're kind of operating in that space, you can find lots of case law on that. Um, there's also a ton of stuff in like accounting journals. Um, if you look at you know, like accounting curriculum. So if you go to like university, like a business school that's teaching people uh, forensic accounting, they will also have uh, have that kind of thing. But the case law on like how Benford's law became admissible, there's a lot of really good resources on that. It can't be the only thing, right? You can't just be like, oh, Benford's law violated, you're going to jail. <laughs> um, but as it being admissible as evidence, yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff. Um, if you need help finding cases, like Rick, you can share my email with anybody. It's also very easy to find on the web. Um, I, I've got all those references like in my Benford's Law folder, so I can totally point you to some if you can't find them. Cool. Uh, so Anne asks, uh, what about negative numbers? Uh, you could use Benford with negative numbers. Um, if you're looking at like losses, for example, like if we stick to accounting, um, I bought Dogecoin before Elon Musk went on SNL and I lost this much money. If that's in your register, it should work fine as long as your numbers can grow positively and negatively. Um, you just ignore the minus sign, basically. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, so, oh, uh... I think you actually mentioned this, what, but what was the number Jack was asking about movie budgets? How many, uh, he said, how many orders did the data span? Which I wasn't sure if orders was the, the term we were looking for, but. Yeah, um, I think it spanned probably two, right? 10 million, I mean, maybe three. There were probably some movies that had budgets of 10 million that grossed less than that, <laughs> right? And so they, they maybe cost $10 million and let's say they grossed $8 million. So that 8 million would be one order of magnitude, kind of a single digit million. And then we have all the two digit millions. And then there's certainly stuff with three digit millions. I don't know if there, are there movies that have made or had budgets in a, of a billion dollars? Uh, I, off the top of my head, I don't think had budgets, but made. Yes. Yeah. So then, so that would be a fourth because the, those, the gross was in there. So um, so yeah, single, double and triple digit millions and then billions. So that would be four orders of magnitude. We probably, I think you probably would get it in there, even if you only had two orders of magnitude, if you had the tens and hundreds of millions, um, and you dropped off those edge cases, just cause there's so many, right. We had 11, almost 12,000 data points. Um, that's enough where, where you should be able to see a, a nice application of Benford, even just in those two orders. So I want to ask Marcel's question here, but it requires that you know what ZIPF's law, Z-I-P-F's law. Yep, okay. yep. So is there a connection between Benford and ZIPF? Yeah, I think, so totally. They're kind of the same thing. I think Benford is a special instance of ZIPF's law, which is essentially this, um, and Benford called his numbers this, the, the uh, law of large numbers which is essentially this logarithmic distribution that you expect that basically it's harder to get to numbers that start with nines. You have a much bigger concentration in the lower numbers. Um, so I, I think that's mathematically the correct way to say it. They're definitely like intimately connected, very close, like first cousins, um, Benford's law and Zip's law. And I think Benford is just a special instance of Zip. So yeah, nice. I wondered if someone was gonna ask that if there were any super math geeks in the audience. Nice job, Marcel. Um, so uh, David and Adam both asked, could this be a function of how human brains work and not nature? Like I think Adam mentioned uh, a murder of crows or maybe like a pack of animals. That's an interesting question. So s some of it probably is. And then, then I guess it gets a little metaphysical, but say, uh, so say we're looking at the, 
the area surface area of rivers, for example. Um, while there are some human engineered rivers, right? Most of these are, are very naturally occurring numbers. Um, we do of course have units for measuring these things, but Benford is independent of units. Like you can come up with any, any unit to measure them in. You could, you know, in like distance, you could measure in smoots or feet or kilometers or whatever, and it, it tends to work there. Um, so it tends not to just be from us grouping. It, it works, you know, in like the decay rates of elements, no matter what, uh, what unit you measure it in. So there's probably some that have to do with that, but it, it seems more present in nature, again, because of that growth element, I think, um, than something that's purely a result of human kind of engineering or the way that, that we think about things. Uh, Val wants to know if pi fo follows Benford's. That's a great question. I think no. Um, I'm sure someone has looked at this, but I think we know that the digits of pi, I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of reinterpreting the question. Uh, pi is one number. It starts with a three. So that's it. Um, people ask this question a lot though. So I assume what they mean are, are do the digits of pi actually have a Benford distribution? Um, we know that pi is a kind of, has random numbers, at, you know, following, uh, in series, basically. So we would expect there to be an equal distribution of all of them. Um, but technically, you can't apply Benford to it because Benford is a first digit analysis and pi is just one number. Um, so Peter wants to know, are there resources for law enforcement professionals who want to use Benford? That's a good question. Um, so I would want to know like what exact kind of resources that he wants. Um, you know, are there like off the shelf tools out there? You know, I'm sure that there's some like forensic uh, auditing places that will have Benford's law available. Um, I've, you know, I've worked with, um, you know, the FBI or other kind of federal level law enforcement, just kind of looking at this in a few spaces. They certainly are already using it in forensic accounting. Like we know federal cases are, are made using Benford's law um, as one tool. Um, but if there's other places like, you know, I'm the, I'm the person who does this on social networks, um, because it's not like super powerful for things, you know, like we can detect bots. Great. You know, nobody's going to make tons of money on that. Um, there's other ways to do it. Uh, I don't, I don't know of any law enforcement that's using it in that space. If they wanted to, I would be the person for them to come to. Um, the good thing is that it's really easy to do. You know, you basically need a spreadsheet. Um, Sarah wants to know if there are other uh, violations of Benford's law that are explainable, you know, that you might that you might have in your back pocket to, to talk about. Um, like other cases where it could be violated. I mean, so so sure, I would say, you know, one thing is that Benford's law essentially is giving you a probability. Um, so Benford's law says there's a 30.1 probability that a number is going to start with a one and, uh, you know, point, uh, like a 4.8% probability a number is going to start with a nine. There are probabilities. So there's going to be, you know, a range of things around all of that. So there are plenty of perfectly legitimate, say, social media accounts that don't look anything like Benford's law. I just finished an experiment where I was looking at, you know, 50,000 accounts. Um, and there's some that don't look a lot like Benford, but they're totally legitimate. They've been verified as legitimate. They're, they're real people doing perfectly normal things. So there's absolutely some expected violation from Benford if you're looking at a lot of different cases. So it doesn't necessarily mean something fraudulent is happening. Um, other times, like in the Pinterest example, it's because there's like one engineered data point that just happens to give you a bunch of numbers in a weird place and there's nothing fraudulent going on. It's just like this evidence of human activity. Um, and in other cases, you know, like in the election data, there were cases where it looked like Trump's vote totals looked like Benford's law. And that was just sort of, they randomly looked like that. Um, you know, Biden's didn't, but they depend on each other. So there's places where you might see it where it actually doesn't make a lot of sense that it shows up there and you just happen to kind of randomly get that. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of, of cases where it doesn't apply and there's nothing nefarious going on and it can be just random variation. It can be something engineered. It can be that you never should have applied it there in the first place. You just happen to get something that looks like it. 
Uh, so we have a few people, including Andrew, who are asking, uh, have you ever heard of tax cheats, or I'll just say, or others who are trying to bend fortify their numbers? There's, they, they think they're clever if they try to do that and, uh, and they can't really. So if, if I'm a forensic accountant coming in, looking at your taxes, um, yeah, you know, the way that frauds normally do it is like, ooh, you know, not a lot of sevens. I'm going to put a number that starts with a seven here. And then that starts not looking like Benford. So you could try to Benfordify your taxes and say, all right, well, I'm keep, I've got a count of all the numbers. If I'm putting one in here, I should, you know, make sure it starts with a three to keep that distribution looking good. Um, but you got to account for the second digit, right? Because that also has its own Benford thing. And you know, other numbers will change based on that, right? If you say, oh, I spent this much on gas, then that's going to change another number later later on. But the most important thing is that we can take all those numbers. Our normal number system is base 10, right? So you count zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then when you get to the 10th number, you're in another order of magnitude. You have two digits. And then when you get another multiply by 10, you get three digits. So we can change that to say base eight or base 16 or any other base. Um, and it's, you know, it's one command to change your numbers. So your hundred now looks like an 87 because it's in a different base, but Benford's law still applies in those other bases. You use that formula with the logarithms from the first slide I did, and then you just get a different number of distribution, you know, different distributions for each of those new first digits and Benford's law has to apply there. So it's really hard to engineer your numbers to say, okay, they work in base 10 if you're looking at it, but they're also going to work in any other base that people pick. So it makes it very easy for a forensic accountant to detect fraud, even if you try to make it look good, because you just can't keep track of if those numbers are going to look right in, in every single base that you could apply it in. And that's why it's such a powerful tool. It's really hard to fake it. So uh, Brian wants to know if you think that Benford's law might have caught Bertie Madoff. That's such a good question. Maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, if he was straight up lying, as opposed to, you know, like a pure Ponzi scheme wouldn't necessarily get caught by Benford. Um, if you're not giving people a lot of data, if you're just, you know, you're paying off uh, older investors with new investors, wouldn't necessarily catch it. But if you are giving people financial reports where you're straight up lying about the amount of money, then yeah, it totally could have and probably likely would have. Um, I don't know enough about like how he did all of his schemes to, to say for sure. But yeah, if there were straight up lies in the financial reports, generally we would catch it with Benford. We've got a number of people in the, in the feed now saying that the Fibonacci sequence does follow Benford's law. Which... All right. So that answers the question. So yeah, there's this like then deep internal like genetic connection between the golden ratio, which is essentially a ratio of two subsequent Fibonacci numbers to Benford's law, which is super cool. So has this ever been used to detect scientific fraud that's from P. Simpson? Sure has. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting papers out there uh, looking exactly at that, where you can take the numbers in a scientific paper, um, whether it's like reported numbers in data sets or the kind of statistical significance, error rates, all of that. Um, in scientific papers, the numbers will follow Benford's law and in scientific data sets. And yes, there's a lot of interesting work on, uh, on using Benford to detect scientific fraud. And that's one of the, one of the main places it's been applied outside of accounting. Uh, so, uh, Lena asks, uh, why do you think, uh, Bedford's, Bed, uh, Benford's law might arise in large scale behavioral systems? Yeah. I, I mean, this is a really good question and it, it kind of comes back to that why question. Um, you know, I think it's, so again, intuitively, it's easy to understand in terms of growth. Like there's a lot of people who will do one thing and there's fewer people who will do two things. Um, you know, we just tend to, we find this, in, and this is sort of independent of Benford, we tend to find this, what we call a power law distribution, where there's a ton of people clustered at the low end, and then a very few number of people at the high end of something. So this, if you think back to like, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, this, the long tail discussion that would often come up when talking about science, you know, why is the internet so great for people? Well, you can 
you can explore that long tail. You can be a group of people interested in a really niche thing. And there's 20 people in the world who are interested in it, but you can find that group online. Um, so behaviorally, like you're going to find a ton of people who are LA Lakers fans. That's going to be a big group. And you're going to find a very small group of like MAGA furries on Reddit, but they probably have a group, right? And so there's a, there's a ton of very small things that are only going to get a few people. And then there's a smaller number of very big things that get lots of people. And so because our human nature goes that way, um, and, and we see this in a lot of things. There's a whole sociological theory called preferential attachment that actually explains exactly how this works. Um, the intuitive idea there is like, if you go into a party and you don't know anybody, and I am the person at the party hanging out with the dog in the corner by myself, I am absolutely that person. And Rick is at the party and he's got like 30 people around him. Which one of us are you going to come up to? I mean, I do have the attraction if I'm hanging out with the dog, but probably you go stand in the circle of people around Rick because he's talking to a big group. We tend to be attracted to connecting to people or objects or whatever that already have a lot of people around them. That's this idea of preferential attachment. It plays out in lots of ways in, in kind of human behavior. That gets us this kind of long tail effect which is connected to Zip's law, which somebody else asked about, and that is a necessary condition for us to end up with Benford. Um, so essentially it's that idea that, that we're attracted to the same kinds of things as other people. And that kind of brings us into groups that grow larger and larger. And that that's kind of the precondition for Benford. That was a really geeky answer. I hope that wasn't, wasn't too out there. So uh, Jen, I think we have uh, time for about one more question here. We do have another uh, an, another link for people who opted for uh, the VIP Q and A uh, or for our supporters. Um, so some of some people will be joining us on the video link. But the last question here uh, from Anna is, and by the way, there were eighty four questions, so uh, we could not get to all of them. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, but Anna is asking, uh, are, is, are there any ways that Benford could be used like kind of like as a proofing tool to spot mistakes? For sure. Um, yeah, because it can be used to detect fraud, you could potentially also use it to detect just when there's been an error in something. So we know it works on scientific data, could work on your taxes. So if, you know, if you are, say you're doing your taxes and you just accidentally typed in like an 800 in some place that you should have typed a 100, and that affects all sorts of other calculations. Um, you could potentially see a violation of Benford there. If you imported an old spreadsheet, I mean, this is something I've done in my data. Like I just grab a, like, you know, version one instead of version two, and the data is totally different. It screws everything up. Um, so yeah, you could potentially use it, especially if you know it's consistently applying to your data to just run a quick check. And if it looks weird to use that as a little flag that maybe you need to to look at something. It won't catch like the one-off mistake, but if you've made a large scale error that has really affected a lot of numbers, yeah, it could be really useful for that. Wow. Well, Anne, it's, it's time for us to do our little uh, goodbye. And Jen, thank you so much for uh, giving this talk today. I, who knew Benford's Law? I, I didn't. And this is, <laughs> I feel like you've opened a whole new world. Awesome. I know. Exactly. Thank you so much, Jen. I think somebody had said in, in their comment or question, both equal parts, mystifying and fascinating. And, <laughs> and I think that's exactly right. It's sort of like, I don't know if I understand it, but I really like it. <laughs> so as always, we really appreciate it, Jen. Thank you so much. Um, it's so amazing to spend time with you. And I know you have to go because you have someplace else that you need to be. Um, and we'll be following you very shortly. Um, and we want to thank our audience for being here as well. Um, we will be, as, of course, in your inbox with future invitations. Um, we met today to kind of plan out our calendar. And we've got lots of ideas, lots of amazing speakers coming your way. And, and we hope that you will be with us again. And we look forward to seeing you on our virtual platform um, as we continue to send you those invitations. So thank you for being here and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.